Well, as a brief introduction to today's speakers, Catherine Gazard is Curator of Art Post-1800 at Royal Museums Greenwich. Through her research and curatorial work, she explores the interconnections between British art and the maritime world. Catherine previously taught art history and museum and gallery studies at the University of East Anglia, where she obtained her PhD in 2019 as part of an AHRC-funded collaborative doctoral partnership between UEA, the National Portrait Gallery, and the National Maritime Museum. Her PhD thesis explored the representation of naval officers in 18th century British portraiture, and her first book which you can see a copy of at the front of the room. The Art of Naval Portraiture was published this March. Sarah Caputo uh, is based at the University of Cambridge, where she is a senior research fellow and director of studies at Maudlin College, a British Academy postdoctoral fellow in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science, and an affiliated lecturer in the Faculty of History. She specializes in the social and cultural maritime history of the 18th and 19th centuries with a particular focus on transnational migration, health and medicine, and mapping. Her first book, Foreign Jack Tars, The British Navy and Transnational Seafarers During the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2022. Her second book, Tracks on the Ocean, A History of Trailblazing, Maps, and Maritime Travel, will appear with Profile Books and the University of Chicago Press this summer, I believe, which is great. She's currently writing a third monograph, she doesn't stop, uh, a comparative and transnational history of naval medicine in the 18th and 19th century British, French, and Spanish navies, including a perspective from below. So with that out of the way, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Catherine Gazard, who will be speaking to us about naval gazing, portraiture, and the Royal Navy. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for that very kind introduction and also for inviting me to present as part of this really exciting seminar series. Um, I'm also very grateful to Ella for all her amazing work in organising as she turns off the lights for us. <laughs> um, so counterintuitively, I would like to start this talk about the imagery of the Royal Navy with a portrait of officers in the British Army. This is John Singer Sargent's General Officers of the First World War, completed in 1922. It is one of three group portraits commissioned for the National Portrait Gallery by the South African mining tycoon, Abe Bailey. The three paintings were intended to commemorate the politicians, the generals, and the admirals who had led Britain during the Great War. Sargent claimed to have accepted the commission for the military picture purely out of a sense of duty, and he struggled with the task, writing to fellow artist James Guthrie, I am handicapped by the idea that the generals never could have been altogether in any particular place, so I feel debarred from any sort of interesting background and reduced to painting them all standing up in a vacuum. These words provide an apt description of the finished painting. The generals stand stiffly in front of a void, or a vacuum, if I can use Sargent's word, between two classical columns, and there is no interaction between the figures. Um, so when the painting was unveiled at the Royal Academy in 1922, some critics echoed Sargent's reservations. Writing in the Times, Arthur Clutton Brock declared, we cannot but feel that these generals never were so gathered together. It is, of course, an interesting collection of paintings, but it is, unfortunately, not a picture. More recently, John Woo Jeremy Kim has described the painting as a vision of the, in his words, absence, impotence, and apprehension of Britain's military leadership in the face of the horrors of the trenches. From my perspective, Sargent's picture is most interesting for the contrast that it offers to its naval counterpart within Bailey's wartime trilogy. Unlike Sargent, Arthur Stockdale Cope seems to have had little difficulty envisaging a scenario in which his 22 admirals could plausibly be shown together. They are gathered in small groups around a central table, discussing strategy over papers and charts. The setting is the Admiralty boardroom in Whitehall. Completed in 1726, the Admiralty was the first purpose-built office building in Britain. It was designed by the architect Thomas Ripley to provide a centralized headquarters for naval administration, and the boardroom was its centerpiece. Cope's portrait shows the 18th century limewood carvings of nautical instruments that lined its walls, and above the doors hang marine paintings from the 17th and 18th centuries. At the head of the table, just uh, up here, uh, 
is Leonardo Gazzardi's portrait of Horatio Nelson, festooned with honours following his fleet's victory at the Battle of the Nile in 1798. The wind dial over the fireplace, just here, um, was once linked to a weather vane on the roof in order to provide live information about sailing conditions on the River Thames. Although rendered obsolete following the advent of steam power, the dial remained in the boardroom in celebration of naval tradition. Thus, whereas Sargent's painting evinced a crisis in confidence concerning the imagery of military command, Copes presented the Royal Navy as a service enthralled to its past with an apparently unwavering sense of its own visual identity. But where did this sense come from? This is the question that I would like to consider in tonight's talk, and it will serve as a lens through which to explore the evolving imagery and cultural functions of naval portraiture across more than three centuries of history. The talk has three parts. Um, we're going to be devoting the first to the 17th century, the second to the 18th, and the third to the 19th. And each part will take as its starting point, or as its anchor, I suppose you might say, a different artwork or set of artworks. We'll be coming back to cope at the very end, but to begin, we're going all the way back to the mid-17th century with the flagman of Lowestoft. Um, so Peter Lely painted this series of 13 portraits for James, Duke of York, the younger brother of Charles II, to commemorate the victory of the English fleet over the Dutch at the Battle of Lowestoft on the 13th of June, 1665. All 13 sitters were flag officers who had fought in the action. And a little bit of naval terminology for those not familiar. A flag officer was a senior commander whose ship was identified with a particular flag. And this is also the origin of the term flagship. So since these paintings predate the introduction of official naval uniform, the flagmen are depicted in a variety of outfits, often aping the military fashions of their colleagues on land. For example, George Monk wears a buff coat. This was a padded leather garment that had been developed for cavalry troops as a lightweight alternative to plate armour. It presents Monk as a practical modern officer, yet the hard-wearing leather also provides a foil for more luxurious fabrics including his lace neck cloth, his red belt, and the blue sash of the Order of the Garter. Gold stripes have even been worked into the coat sleeves, and the result is a combination of robustness and elegance that you can see echoed in many of the other portraits in the series. Crucially, all 13 sitters are depicted with attributes of naval command, including, I'm going to do some pointing here, uh, cannons, globes, swords, and anchors. And in the background, rocky cliffs and architectural fragments frame sea views and distant naval battles. This iconographic formula, coastal settings, nautical, nautical accoutrements, and ships in the distance, um, this was relatively new to British art at this time. And I think some background on naval history will be relevant here. So the first stirrings of English naval power can be traced back to the ad hoc fleets of the medieval period. Um, which were brought together for particular campaigns and then disbanded. It was in the Tudor period that the nation gained its first standing navy, that is, a fleet maintained on a permanent basis. Yet naval command was not yet a dedicated profession. Postings were awarded with little regard for relevant experience or continuity of service, and officers lacked a coherent identity, comprising an assortment of noble courtiers and professional seafarers, many of whom combined naval duties with merchant voyages and privateering. Portraits reflected the disparate identities of naval commanders in this period, and successful officers were often depicted with little or no reference to their seafaring exploits. For example, in this portrait from the 1620s, Lord Howard, who commanded the English fleet that defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588, he wears the full regalia of the Order of the Garter, conforming to a pre-existing type of court portraiture the garter portrait. The only allusion to his naval career is the battle scene in the background here, although this area of the painting is now so badly abraded, only sort of ghostly traces of the ship's sails are visible. A decade or so later, Anthony van Dyck's full-length portrait of Algernon Percy helped to inaugurate a new trend for including multiple symbols of naval service within officers' portraits. Percy, as you can see, is shown leaning on an anchor with a naval engagement in the background. Lely's flagman continued and expanded this approach, incorporating influences from Dutch precedents. The Dutch Republic was at this time the world's leading maritime power, with a stranglehold on many global trade routes. 
admirals were highly politicised figures within Dutch culture, giving rise to a distinctive tradition of sea-themed portraiture. Dating from the 1640s, Jan Lieven's portrait of Martin Tromp uh, with his hand on a cannon provides a typical example. A parallel development in the Dutch Republic was the emergence of the specialised genre of marine painting, dedicated to the representation of ships and fleets. As Tromp's portrait demonstrates, the iconography of marine painting bled into naval portraiture. This scene in the background over here is in effect, or is in effect a miniaturised marine painting. It also creates an element of duplication within the image, since the sitter is technically depicted twice. He is both standing in the foreground and implicitly he is aboard his distant vessel. This double vision serves as a metaphor for the naval officer's ability to move between the floating world of the warship, which had its own language, hierarchies and conventions, and the land-bound world of high society. The spread of this imagery across the North Sea was encouraged by the high number of Dutch and Northern European émigré artists working in England, and Lely was an example of this trend. So we'll go back to the flagman of Lowestoft. Lely had trained in Harlem before moving to London in 1641. Yet this was also a time of Anglo-Dutch conflict. Indeed, that's what the Battle of Lowestoft was, an engagement between the English and the Dutch. Um, and the English were at this time endeavouring to challenge the Dutch Republic's naval and mercantile supremacy. Against this backdrop, high-profile patrons in England, including not least Charles II and his brother, the Duke of York, they were keen to appropriate the flourishing traditions of Dutch maritime art, the point being to prove that English commanders and English warships were as deserving of pictorial commemoration as their Dutch counterparts. Charles II also invested in the Royal Navy itself, authorising the Admiralty to embark on a process of reform and professionalisation. Naval administrator and famous diarist Samuel Pepys oversaw the creation of a new framework for the training, payment and promotion of officers. Naval command was reconceived as a lifelong career, open to individuals from a range of backgrounds, and all officers had to meet minimum standards of competence. This made the Royal Navy unique. It would be a long time before the army embraced a similar degree of professionalism. Pepys's reforms also fostered the development of a shared sense of professional identity among officers, and over time, portraits became an important vehicle through which this emerging identity was expressed and reinforced. The seeds of what we might call an institutional iconography are contained in the flagman of Lowestoft, which Pepys himself saw in Lely's studio in April 1666. However, at the time, the Royal Navy's nascent pictorial identity was confined to the relatively narrow circles of the royal court. Because as I previously mentioned, the patron for this series was James, Duke of York. He had been Lord High Admiral since 1660, and this was not simply a ceremonial position. He had actively commanded the, the English fleet at several battles, Lowestoft included. Depicting his fellow commanders, um, the flagman hung together in the great chamber at Colford Hall, James's country residence. They formed part of a decorative scheme that also included silk hangings, gilt sconces, calico window curtains, and what was described in royal inventories as a Jamaica wood table. The latter was presumably made from a tropical hardwood imported from the Caribbean via maritime trading networks. James himself was heavily involved in merchant seafaring through his governorship of the Royal African Company, which had a monopoly over English trade on the West African coast, including the enslavement and forced transportation of people. Through its portraits and its furnishings then, the Great Chamber imbued him with a royal identity that looked, if I can borrow the title of this seminar series, out to sea, encompassing his involvement in both naval warfare and colonial trade. In effect, these portraits were about the identity that James was constructing, the persona that James was constructing for himself within the political theatre of the royal court. Yet this style of naval portraiture would prove influential. Several decades later, the flagman of Lowestoft inspired another series of royally commissioned portraits. At the turn of the 18th century, Prince George of Denmark, the husband of Queen Anne, employed Godfrey Nella and Michael Dahl to create these 15 portraits of leading admirals. Conceived as a sequel of sorts to the flagman, this series featured many of the same motifs, cannons, anchors, rugged cliffs, and distant ships. However, these images reached a broader audience outside of the royal court after a number of them were engraved in mezzotint, 
And here's just one example to show you. The market for fine art prints was exploding in this period, and portraits of well-known officers sold well because they catered to an emerging culture of celebrity. As one colleague once memorably said to me, the 18th century was a period in which people followed the Royal Navy like a football team, reading reports from recent actions and debating which commanders had performed well and who had done badly. Through their consumption of prints, this audience also learned to recognise the visual language of naval portraiture. And this is where we can turn to the example on screen here, John Faber's Mezzotint of George Bing, published in 1718. 22 years later, an anonymous publisher issued an amended version of the print. The image was virtually unchanged, except for the admiral's head, which had been re-engraved with a different likeness, and the inscription beneath had been rewritten to name the sitter not as George Bing, but as Vice Admiral Edward Vernon, who became a popular hero after capturing Portobello from the Spanish in November 1739. For publishers eager to profit from Vernon's sudden popularity, creating a portrait mezzotint from a pre-existing one had obvious advantages, saving time, money, and energy. Yet the enterprise was only worth pursuing if the image could be expected to pass as a depiction of a contemporary naval officer, despite the plate at this point being over 20 years old um, and the, you know, kind of, uh, the portrait that it was based on actually being another 10 years older than that. The fact that this was thought to be an image that could pass as a naval officer in 1740 demonstrates the extent to which certain conventions for representing the naval profession had become entrenched in the public mind. The relationship between naval portraiture and print culture is also highlighted in the second section of tonight's talk um, that we'll turn to now. So the launch pad, the anchor for this section, is Francis Heyman's Triumph of Britannia, a massive allegorical painting which was installed in the rotunda at Vauxhall Gardens in May 1762. Now the canvas itself no longer survives, but its appearance is known through this engraving. The image features a combination of allegory, portraiture, and marine painting. In the center, Neptune drives a chariot across the sea. His passenger is Britannia, who holds aloft a medallion portrait of King George III. Visible in the distance, uh, just over here, is the Battle of Quiberon Bay, an Anglo-French naval engagement which had taken place on the 20th of November, 1759. The result had been a decisive British victory, helping to turn the tide in the Seven Years' War. And by the end of that conflict, Britain had secured massive territorial gains in North America and India, to which we'll be coming back in a moment. Edward Hawke, who commanded the British fleet at Quiberon Bay, is represented in a medallion portrait here in the foreground, and similar medallion portraits represent other naval officers of the time. These portraits are carried through the waves by naked sea nymphs who, sim along, who swim alongside tritons and sea monsters. As an allegory of naval supremacy, this composition evoked Baroque precedents, including Antonio Verrio's Sea Triumph of Charles II, which commemorated England's victory in the Third Anglo-Dutch War in 1674. This painting shows Charles II riding in Neptune's chariot, anticipating Heyman's later representation of George III's portrait in a seaborne carriage. However, while certain aspects of the Triumph of Britannia recalled this long-established allegorical tradition, the naval portraits in the foreground, and I've pulled them all out for you here, they belonged emphatically to the modern world. With their mid-18th century wigs and hairstyles, these officers would not have looked out of place among the fashionable visitors at Vauxhall and their clothing was similarly up to date. Sporting dark coloured coats with white lapels and shimmering metallic lace, most are dressed in the Royal Navy's first official uniform, which had been introduced 14 years previously in April 1748. Their uniformity would have been even more obvious in the painting than it is in this monochrome engraving, um, since all the outfits would have shared the same blue and gold colour scheme. At this stage, uniform was only for officers, being intended to signal their authority over the ship's company when at sea and their genteel social status when ashore. Following its introduction, uniform quickly became an indispensable component of officers' portraiture, and it gave rise to new creative possibilities. Previously, as we've seen, artists had used anchors, cannons, and other maritime motifs to symbolise membership of the naval profession. But uniform rendered such details unnecessary. Naval identity could now be signposted even within the confines of small medallion portraits. 
When viewers looked at the Triumph of Britannia, many would have recognised the flashes of naval uniform that we can see in these images. And for some, the officers' faces would have also looked familiar. This is because Heyman based most of the portraits on published mezzotints after recent paintings. The only exceptions are Edward Hawke here, who the artist um, reportedly painted from life, and Richard Howe on the end, whose face is partially obscured, perhaps because Heyman could not find a printed source for his likeness. The other five portraits are closely modelled on the related prints, except for the fact that the images have been reversed. Heyman's use of printed sources highlights the widespread circulation and reproduction of naval portraits throughout this period. It also demonstrates the important role that one artist in particular played in this process. That artist was Joshua Reynolds, and four of the five prints on this slide are after his paintings. Not only does this reflect Reynolds' status as one of Britain's leading portraitists in this period, but it also evinces the close relationship that he shared with the Royal Navy. This relationship had its roots in his childhood in Devon, where he grew up close to the busy naval dockyard in Plymouth. After training as a portraitist in London in the early 1740s with Thomas Hudson, um, who incidentally was responsible for the final portrait on this slide. So after training with, Hud with Hudson in London in the, in the early 1740s, Reynolds returned to his native region to hone his skills. Living close to Plymouth Dockyard, he built up a network of local patrons, including landowners and naval officers. Plymouth Society was at this time intimately intertwined with the Royal Navy, and Reynolds's portraits testify to this fact. A typical example is this depiction of Captain George Edgecombe, completed in 1749. In the painting, the young Reynolds demonstrated his familiarity with the established conventions of naval portraiture, using architecture to frame a distant view of the sitter's ship, just down here. Yet this setting also brings specific local context to the painting, because it alludes to Mount Edgecombe, the aristocratic captain's family seat, which overlooked Plymouth Harbour. The sandstone wall over here on the right, covered in ivy, belongs to the Blockhouse, a defensive fortification built on the grounds of the estate in the 16th century. The two columns are part of a classical portico added to that structure in the early 18th century, and the three cannon in the lower left represent a gun battery on the shore below. And you can see a slightly later view of that same part of the estate in this etching from 1820. The estate belonged to the sitter's father, Lord Edgecombe, who was one of Reynolds's principal patrons at this time. As a younger son, Captain Edgecombe did not stand to inherit, and his fortunes were instead dependent on the success of his naval career. He did, however, represent his father's interest in local politics through his role as an alderman of the Corporation of Plimpton. This corporation controlled a local parliamentary seat, and they were also the ones who commissioned this portrait, hanging the picture in the town's guild hall as a show of allegiance to the Edgecombe family. Reynolds' choice of location therefore seems intended to foreground the confluence of familial, local, political, and naval concerns. Perhaps the most unusual detail of the portrait is the bird up here on the right. As a younger son, Oh, sorry, uh, where have I got to? Uh, this, this is a long-tailed paradise widder, a species native to eastern Africa. It presumably arrived on British shores through, extensive, through the extensive trade in African wildlife during this period, which catered to a European market for exotic pets. As a naval officer, Captain Edgecombe may have seized this bird from an enemy merchant vessel, or perhaps he simply purchased it himself um, because he fancied it as a pet. Either way, within the portrait, it functions as a symbol of colonial trading networks, emphasizing Plymouth's status as a gateway to Atlantic trade routes. This example thus demonstrates the prominence of naval portraiture in public life around Britain at this time, and also it shows the genre's role in tying together local, national, and global narratives. Indeed, Reynolds owed the next development in his career to this context. In May 1749, shortly after this portrait was completed, Captain Edgecombe's father introduced Reynolds to another aristocratic naval officer, Augustus Keppel. And Reynolds and Keppel would go on to become close friends. Keppel was at this time a rising star in the Royal Navy, on his way to take over as commander-in-chief in the Mediterranean. Lord Edgecombe convinced him to take Reynolds as a passenger aboard his ship, providing the artist with an opportunity to study Italian Renaissance masterpieces and classical ruins at first hand. 
Returning from this grand tour three years later, Reynolds set about establishing a new studio in London, where he hoped to attract clients with his newfound continental sophistication. Famously, one of the first portraits that he painted in the capital was this full-length depiction of his friend Keppel. The portrait appears to have been displayed for a number of years in Reynolds's studio, serving as a demonstration of his talents, and contemporary commentators stressed how innovative it was, in particular through its sense of action and animation. Keppel is shown striding across a beach, taking command in the aftermath of a shipwreck. Shattered planks, you might just be able to see them here, um, from the wreck can be glimpsed in the waves, and this alludes to the wreck of Keppel's ship, the Maidstone, in June 1747. At a time when most portraits showed their sitters holding plight poses in front of distant backdrops, this dynamic depiction was radical. Blurring the boundaries between portraiture and history painting, this picture inaugurated a new style of so-called grand manner portraiture. But I think it is also important to examine the imagery that we see here within the specific context of naval portraiture. The painting echoes the conventions of the genre, after all, incorporating both a seashore setting and a naval incident, that shipwreck in the background. Yet importantly, the allusion to the wreck of the Maidstone did not straightforwardly flatter Keppel's professional abilities. Um, so to give you a bit of context on that wreck, his determined pursuit of a French merchant had taken his ship into dangerously shallow waters on the Brittany coast, where it founded on the rocks and was wrecked. Following the disaster, Keppel was summoned to appear before an admiralty court-martial, where his actions were scrutinised. This is typical of the systems of accountability that existed in the Royal Navy by this time in the mid-18th century. Keppel was ultimately cleared of negligence, and at least one admiral remarked that he liked Keppel's eagerness to come at the enemy. Reynolds may have assumed that his viewers would share this positive interpretation. However, the floating debris could also be read as a warning against hubris or as a reminder of the fine line between life and death at sea. This ambivalence can be related to the concept of the sublime, which became increasingly important in British aesthetics in the second half of the 18th century, finding seminal expression five years after this portrait's completion in Edmund Burke's philosophical inquiry on the origins of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful. Burke defined the sublime in terms of the thrill that the viewer feels when witnessing something powerful and dangerous. Surveying British literature produced in this period, Franz de Bruin has traced what he describes as the eclipse of the heroic and the emergence of the sublime. De Bruin attributes this shift to the growth of the modern nation state and the formalization of state institutions, such as the Royal Navy. As the heroic qualities of power and greatness became attributes of institutions, the power and greatness of individuals was circumscribed by frameworks of discipline, duty, accountability, and bureaucracy. In response, the characteristics of martial prowess and greatness of soul were translated into the realm of the sublime, becoming subjects for art and aesthetic contemplation. Because whereas the greatness of the hero was displayed and proved in action, the grandeur of the sublime manifested itself in the emotional responses of an essentially passive perceiver. Um, that might sound all a little bit abstract, but hopefully you can see what I mean when I say Keppel's portrait exemplifies this trade-off, because this painting does not attempt to celebrate or justify Keppel's actions. Instead, it uses the wreck of the Maidstone to evoke danger and drama, which prompts us as viewers to feel impressed. This portrait is about making Keppel look impressive and look grand. It's rather a case of style over substance. In the decades that followed, Reynolds continued to produce naval portraits in a similar vein. Take, for example, his portrait of Vice Admiral Charles Saunders, painted in 1760. This painting does not refer to any specific episodes within the sitter's career. Instead, there is an atmospheric backdrop of swirling storm clouds, and stark contrasts of light and dark uh, accentuate the Vice Admiral's tense and twisted pose, his fingers down here gripping the crown of an anchor. Uh, you can just see the, the other parts of the anchor um, here. Um, and so as with the earlier portrait of Augustus Keppel, this picture is more about making Saunders look commanding than it is about his actions. And thanks to the print market, large audiences were exposed to this kind of imagery. Soon after this painting's completion, printed reproductions of the work began appearing for public sale, the earliest being this high-quality mezzotint by James McArdle, which was subsequently copied to make cheap prints and book illustrations, including uh, this one in the Royal Magazine in August eight, uh, 1760, 
and this one in John Barrow's Naval History of Great Britain in 1761. These examples underscore the extent to which naval portraits, and Reynolds's in particular, suffused British popular culture. Saunders's likeness also featured in the Triumph of Britannia at Vauxhall Gardens. He is uh, just down here, uh, resting on the thigh of this nymph here. A venue for masquerades, musical performances, and artistic display, Vauxhall has been recognized by scholars as a crucial site in the emergence of the plight public sphere. Strolling along the tree-lined avenues, members of the mercantile and professional classes could imagine themselves collectively as a refined public, united through their shared tastes, moral virtues, and national identity. Heyman's painting reflected the importance of naval and maritime themes within that collective culture. The painting hung here, um, so in this sort of area in the background here, uh, which is the vestibule of the Vauxhall Rotunda. And it hung alongside three other monumental canvases, all representing subjects related to the Seven Years' War. Heyman conceived these four pictures as a set. Two were history paintings, the surrender of Montreal to General Amherst and Robert Clive and Mir Jafar after the Battle of Plassey, both now known to us through the artist's preparatory studies, which are what you're seeing on screen. Applying the conventions of academic history painting to the representation of recent events, these works centered on displays of magnanimity by British military commanders in Canada and India. As well as lending a virtuous veneer to Britain's recent imperial conquests, the emphasis on human sympathy in these images was designed to appeal to Vauxhall's middle-class visitors. Striking a compromise between high art and public taste, Heyman presented Amherst and Clive as heroes of the here and now who embodied the natural ties of sentiment. The final painting in the Rotunda Quartet was another allegory, Britannia distributing laurels to the victorious generals. Now, no visual records of this picture survive, hence the big empty box on my slide, um, but written descriptions indicate that it was a military counterpoint to the triumph of Britannia, showing leading generals dressed in ancient Roman armour receiving laurel crowns from peace and Britannia. Douglas Fordham has argued that both the triumph of Britannia and Britannia distributing laurels were designed to counterbalance the demotic impulses of the history paintings that they hung alongside, if Amherst and Clive appealed to bourgeois sympathies, Fordham writes, the allegorical canvases suggested that royal power and aristocratic notions of military engagement sanctioned humanitarian gestures on the imperial fringe. This reading suits Britannia distributing laurels, in which the modern generals were, as I mentioned earlier, dressed up to look like classical ancient Roman heroes. Yet the triumph of Britannia presented a slightly more complex spectacle. As Peter de Bolla has written, and I'm quoting here, the image pulsates with barely containable energy, the power of the turbulent sea, the rearing of the horses, the distant battle depicted in the background, and the all too visible sexual desire that throbs through the naked female figures. Now, whether or not we, degree, we agree with de Bolla's contention that these nymphs are throbbing with desire, their behavior towards the portraits, which I'll remind you look like they could have come straight from a London print shop, their behaviour towards those portraits is certainly affectionate and informal. I'm always particularly struck by um, this woman down here, who appears to be sort of embracing, um, that's actually Augustus Keppel again in the corner there. So for de Bolla, the pounding of power in this picture beats not to the rhythm of the royal court. This is no stately, orderly, hierarchical procession. But instead, it, ha it has taken on some of the energy of the Vauxhall crowd, and thus confirms the viewer's membership of a generally accessible visual culture. And the naval portraits, in their familiarity and their modernity, are key to this effect. In essence, audiences in Britain were learning to recognize naval portraiture as a distinctly modern genre, which expressed a new kind of institutional authority. And here it's worth noting that while Reynolds translated naval authority into the realm of the sublime, other artists in this period were producing portraits that celebrated navigation, administration, and bureaucracy, emphasizing the Royal Navy's status as a well-organized and professional institution. I'll just share one example of this trend as a segue into the third and final part of tonight's talk. And that example is Nathaniel Dancer's portrait of Captain James Cook. Sittings for this portrait took place in 1775, shortly before Cook departed on his final journey to the Pacific. His first two voyages, um, well, on his first two voyages, Cook had been tasked by the Admiralty with searching for a theorised great southern continent 
which it was hoped would provide new opportunities for colonial expansion and resource extraction. While Cook failed to find the predicted continent, he did chart the coastlines of New Zealand and Eastern Australia, paving the way for British colonisation of these lands. In the portrait, he points to his own chart of the Australian coast, yet there is no attempt to visualise any of the places that he had surveyed. Instead, he sits in front of an empty sea, and his work is presented as abstract and intellectual, rather than as part of the messy process of colonisation or the violence of naval warfare. Images like this laid the foundations for the painting that will form the focus of the final part of tonight's talk. Stephen Pierce's The Arctic Council Planning a Search for Sir John Franklin, painted in 1851. Although British travellers had ventured to polar regions in earlier periods, it was only after the Napoleonic Wars that Arctic exploration became an important area of naval activity. In an effort to give the Royal Navy focus and purpose in the absence of a major international conflict, the Admiralty launched a series of missions in search of a Northwest Passage, a fabled sea route linking the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The Arctic soon came to be seen as a crucial proving ground for British technological, scientific, commercial, and moral prowess. It also became a source of public fascination. Throughout the 1820s and the 1830s, popular lectures, panoramas, and books were dedicated to polar themes, while dinners and balls were held in honour of returning explorers. Artists quickly began to adapt the conventions of naval portraiture to represent this new cohort of Arctic celebrities, substituting ice fields in place of seascape backgrounds. John Robert Wildman's depiction of Commander James Clark Ross provides a typical example. Completed in 1834, this portrait commemorates the young commander's return from a four-year-long voyage to the Arctic. The background is a polar landscape, the pole star glints overhead, and the dip circle in the lower right alludes to Ross's study of the North Magnetic Pole in 1831. Ross himself wears a massive bearskin over his naval uniform. This outfit bears little relation to the cold weather attire that British officers actually wore in this period, which consisted of multiple layers of woolen clothing under a sealskin or canvas smock. What Ross wears here is instead a fantasy version of Arctic dress intended for the ballrooms of fashionable society. While the bearskin alludes to his need to protect himself against freezing temperatures, it is also a luxury commodity connoting wealth and refinement. Moreover, the fur trade was a primary driver of European interests in North America, hence fur garments signified the process of, in, of imperial expansion. Dressed in the pelt of a wild animal, Ross is likened to a creature of the wilderness, while also being framed as a conqueror of nature. The layering of uniform and bearskin allowed him to combine the respectability of a gentleman with something of the glamorous and dangerous allure of an outsider. Indeed, when this painting was exhibited at the Society of British Artists in May 1834, a review in the Ladies Magazine declared, this is a spirited, well-painted portrait of a gallant-looking gentleman who has, in his gala Arctic dress, made himself a very picturesque bundle of fur. The phrase gala Arctic dress acknowledges that Ross's clothing is more fancy dress than working attire, and the critic stresses the costume's aesthetic appeal, describing the young commander as a picturesque bundle of fur. There is arguably a romantic or even sexual undercurrent to this comment. As its name suggests, the ladies' magazine was aimed at an audience of women, and a later passage in the same review explicitly encouraged female readers to show their appreciation for Ross, stating that, and this is another quote, the brave commander ought to be made a pet lion of by the ladies. This playful rhetoric recalls the frivolous and slightly risque presentation of naval portraits in the Triumph of Britannia 70-odd years before. However, the polar regions would not always be seen as a playground for gallant heroes. On the 19th of May, 1845, two ships, Erebus and Terror, set sail from the Thames under the command of Captain Sir John Franklin. There were high hopes that this expedition would be the one to finally discover the Northwest Passage, vindicating the Royal Navy's by now substantial investment in Arctic exploration. And the voyage embraced several cutting edge new technologies, including photography. Franklin sourced a camera for the expedition and he commissioned the photographer Richard Beard to produce these daguerreotype portraits of his officers. Taken only a few days before the expedition departed, these are some of the earliest photographic naval portraits ever made. And even in this novel medium, many historic conventions of the genre are apparent. 
Clad in their uniforms, the officers sat for their portraits in an improvised studio on the deck of the Erebus. And although a cloth backdrop has been used in some of the images, others utilise details of the ship to provide a nautical background. For example, the ship's wheel is visible here, over the shoulder of Lieutenant Henry Levesquant. A number of his colleagues hold telescopes. Um, you can see Fitzjames with one here and Franklin himself as well. Telescopes had been a common prop in naval portraits since the 17th century. Not only was a telescope one of the tools of the naval officer's trade, but it also symbolised the moral qualities of vigilance and farsightedness. Through the combination of traditional imagery and innovative technology, these daguerreotypes positioned the Franklin voyage as a link between Britain's naval heritage and hoped for new economic, military and scientific opportunities that it was thought would be unlocked by the discovery of a Northwest Passage. And many of these officers sent their portraits home to their families, recalling a centuries-long tradition of naval officers using portraits as a way of mitigating their absence when departing on lengthy and dangerous voyages. But none of these men ever came home. Instead, the Erebus and the Terror disappeared in the ice along with their entire crews. A series of naval and private rescue missions eventually pieced together a partial account of their fate, but many questions remain unanswered to this day. In September 1851, three years into the search effort, the Illustrated London News published engravings of the daguerreotypes. Set against the uncertainty concerning the expedition's fate, this grid of naval portraits offered a reassuring sense of order. And the publication of the daguerreotypes was just one of several ways in which portraiture was used to keep the plight of the missing men in the public eye. Two months earlier, Stephen Pearce had unveiled the Arctic Council planning a search for Sir John Franklin at the Pall Mall print shop of the publishing firm Graves & Co. While the daguerreotypes showed the officers who had been lost, this artwork claimed to represent a committee of polar experts assembled to find them. However, the Arctic Council of Pierce's title was not an official body, but rather an informal network of naval veterans brought together through the influence of Lady Jane Franklin, the missing commander's wife, and John Barra Jr., whose late father, Admiralty Secretary John Barra Sr., had planned and provisioned the lost expedition. Through concerted lobbying, Lady Franklin and Barrow convinced the British government, private investors, commercial whalers and foreign powers to fund and facilitate the vast rescue operation. It was, in effect, Lady Franklin and Barrow who were the real driving forces behind the search. They also embraced portraiture as a means to advance their cause. Between them, Barrow and Lady Franklin commissioned more than 40 portraits, many of which were submitted to the annual exhibitions of the Royal Academy, ensuring that the search effort stayed in the public eye throughout the 1850s. The Arctic Council was the first portrait that Barrow commissioned. It depicts a group of 10 men gathered around a table, pointing and gesturing at letters, papers, and Arctic charts. Dressed in dark suits and naval uniforms, the men depicted were all prominent figures in the field of polar exploration. Barrow, who commissioned the portrait, is depicted here at the back of the group um, in his official role as Admiralty Archivist, and the three portraits on the back wall depict uh, over here his father, John Burris Sr., who'd planned the lost expedition, and two of its missing officers, Franklin himself and Commander James Fitzjames. Lady Franklin is notably absent, her gender precluding her from any kind of official position. This was something that she leveraged to her own advantage. To win public sympathy, she consciously presented herself as the archetypal Victorian wife, sentimental, dutiful, and concerned for her husband's welfare. Yet she and Barrow were also keen that the search effort was seen as an objective endeavour, rather than simply the indulgence of a wife in denial about her widowhood. Hence, the imagery of Pierce's portrait, including the uniforms, papers, and charts, seems designed to connote professionalism, masculine collegiality, institutional loyalty, scientific knowledge, and rational debate. The Arctic Council stands in stark contrast to the romantic polar fantasies of the 1820s and 1830s. James Clark Ross, who we previously saw as a picturesque bundle of fur, is now a grey-haired figure standing stoically beneath Franklin's portrait. The disappearance of Erebus and Terror had dispelled some of the glamour from Arctic exploration. While Britain itself was entering a new information age with telegraphs and railways connecting people and places at increasingly rapid speeds, the Arctic remained distant, unknowable, and dangerous. Against this background, the Arctic Council attempted to reassure viewers that with enough data, intelligence, and expertise, polar mysteries could be solved, all from the comfort of a London dining room.
And it's also notable here that the painting glosses over the contributions that indigenous communities in the Arctic made to the search effort. Indeed, this picture reflects broader developments in the organization of the British Empire. Whereas the nation's focus in preceding centuries had been on fighting other European powers and colonizing territories around the world, Britain now faced the challenge of managing a vast global empire, including many different environments, peoples, languages, and cultures. Statistics, maps, and records became tools of control that the British Empire wielded with enthusiasm, and naval portraiture was well positioned to reflect this development. As we've seen, works like Nathaniel Dance's portrait of Captain James Cook had set a precedent for the visualization of imperial themes through charts and maps. By the mid-19th century, Cook's portrait was on public display, hanging here in the National Gallery of Naval Art, otherwise known as the Naval Gallery, in the Painted Hall at Greenwich Hospital. Since the late 17th century, Greenwich Hospital had provided care and accommodation to elderly and disabled naval veterans. Built originally as the hospital's refectory, the Painted Hall took its name from James Thornhill's early 18th century allegorical murals on the walls and ceilings, which celebrated royal authority and naval triumph. The Naval Gallery was established in this space in April 1824. Featuring portraits, marine paintings, and sculptures, its displays were designed to provide a visual history of British maritime endeavor. And they also established a canon of British maritime art. Lely's Flagman of Lowestoft that we saw earlier were displayed here, having been donated to the gallery by George IV, and the collection also included portraits by Reynolds and other masters. Underpinning the Naval Gallery was a yearning for the past, the absence of major naval battles that followed the end of the Napoleonic Wars, having created nostalgia for the glorious victories of earlier periods. At the same time, the Naval Gallery commissioned new artworks to represent current naval activity, charting the Royal Navy's transformation into a modern steam-powered fleet principally employed in peacekeeping, policing, and survey work around the British Empire. The Arctic Council was never displayed in the Naval Gallery, but two related portraits were. These depicted naval hydrographer Francis Beaufort and our friend again, polar explorer James Clark Ross. Both pictures were posthumous tributes, commissioned to commemorate their sitters' deaths in 1857 and 1862, respectively. Stephen Pearce produced the two paintings, basing the likenesses on his earlier depictions of Beaufort and Ross in the Arctic Council. Each man is shown sitting at a desk with a nautical chart spread across its surface. This composition echoes Dance's portrait, linking Cook, Beaufort and Ross together in a continuum of navigational endeavor. And to emphasize the point, the three portraits were displayed together in the northwest corner of the Naval Gallery. The only notable point of difference is the absence of a sea view in Pierce's portraits. Rather than looking out to sea, these later images display a myopic interest in documentation. Meanwhile, the Arctic Council, we'll go back to it here, also entered a national collection after it was bequeathed to the National Portrait Gallery in 1898. It's possible that Arthur Stockdale Cope had the Arctic Council in mind when he was commissioned to paint the naval officers of the First World War for the NPG in 1921, and his depiction of naval men making plans around a table is certainly reminiscent of Pierce's picture. So to conclude, the title for this seminar series is Out to Sea, but this talk has followed a journey in the opposite direction, traveling inland from the beach to the boardroom. In the 17th and 18th centuries, naval portraits employed coastal settings to symbolize colonial expansion, maritime trade, and naval warfare. Yet over time, the focus of the genre turned inwards. Portraits legitimized particular manifestations of authority within the Royal Navy, and reinforced the service's institutional and bureaucratic structures. The sea ceased to be a central element. Instead, it was circumscribed, distanced, or entirely absent. And Cope's portrait provides an example. Through the marine paintings on the wall and the chart on the table, the sea is reduced to a subject of aesthetic interest and technical knowledge. The shifts that we see in naval portraiture prompt us to think about professionalization, about the way that British imperial institutions consolidated their power, and about the role that portraits played in both processes. Um, this is portraits through their role reflecting institutions back at themselves. The pun naval gazing that I used playfully in the title for this talk might actually seem quite appropriate here. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm shorter. <laughs>
Thank you, Catherine. That was wonderful. And the book is also wonderful. I got my own copy here. Um, I read it from cover to cover. And I was saying to Catherine, I read it at the end of the day when all the work was done. Because this is work, but it was such an enjoyable book to read that I, um, that was a treat. Um, so just um, a few words about the book itself. I really loved the structure. I don't know if you've had a chance of... Um, looking at it, um, it's organized like an exhibition. The images are fantastic and each painting is really dissected on its own and it, yet all of these discussions tie together into the flow of argument that we've already heard about tonight. So um, I think it's a really wonderful and successful book. Um, I think one... Oh, this moves. <laughs> I think that... Um, one thing that the book captures really well is an idea that um, is probably very obvious to a history of art audience, but wouldn't necessarily be to maritime historians or other people who are picking up um, this book. The notion that these portraits are not private objects or representations, uh, the public use of these people's image. Um, and in, in stressing this over and over again uh, throughout the book, I think, um, this is a contribution to um, the history of the Navy as a public institution, but also um, shows really well the reach of the naval world um, into the spheres of fame and later celebrity. There's this uh, paradigm um, that was proposed by, by French historian Antoine Lilti, uh, the idea that um, over the course of this period, there is a transition from fame, which is an admiration for these distant glorious figures, to celebrity, which is more similar to what we have today, if we want to simplify, an attention to the intimate, uh, to, to the day-to-day -day, uh, life of your subjects. And this is what we see in these portraits and how um, very personal things like aging, emotions, sometimes even um, bodily impairment. Tessa Michels has written a bit about um, amputation and naval portraiture. All of these very personal aspects actually get shown and become part of naval propaganda at large. Um, so that is... Quite interesting, but both fame and celebrity are by their nature selective. Um, so I'm really interested in how your book captures this selectivity. And it does so really well and in a very sensitive manner. And there are various sides to this selectivity of the things that we've been seeing tonight and the things that are in the book. Not just because the book has selected them, it's, just, it's because who got to be portrayed and in what circumstances um, was selective to begin with. So there are very, very few common sailors in the book. Um, I think before the 20th century in particular. Um, the key example is William Matthews, um, who is the Greenwich pensioner, and he gets um, his own portrait. But otherwise, there aren't um, any lower deck sailors. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of cartoons depicting um, sailors, um, normally in a fairly stylized or caricatured way. Uh, and the, there are some paintings in which they appear in the background, like naval battle scenes. Um, and there are also individual seamen who got their own portrait distributed more widely. Uh, a famous example is Jack Crawford, who was at the Battle of Camperdown in 1797. Um, and when the colours were shot um, off the mast, he allegedly went up and nailed them back on. And so this act was turned into a staple of wartime propaganda and much like a lot of the admirals and officers he ended up on crockery he was uh, represented on, on plates and mugs um, etc so there's a second layer beneath this world of uh, the, the actual paintings of naval representation um, however the expensive portraits remain the purview of the officers, um, because the key question is, I suppose, who would pay for them? Uh, who would give them to whom if the subject um, is not moving within those circles? Um, as Catherine points out in the book, even when we get to the 20th century, um, and we do see some portraits of common sailors, very often they are intended to be generic representations. 
Um, so Jack Crawford, we know his name, but he was just a stand-in for the Jack Tar and the heroism of, of the rank and file. Implicit in a representation like that is the idea that that is just one of countless similar gestures that take place during the battle. And so, and similarly, Catherine has a few of these portraits of 20th century servicemen and service women, in fact, at that point. Uh, and they are often just stand-ins for the generic unknown soldier. We know who they are, but who they are doesn't really matter. It's a portrait of a collective rather than individual. Uh, and so maybe this is an unavoidable feature of naval structures. There's a class discussion here, and as we said, the, the value of a painting, the cost of a painting, but a naval, naval structures rest on discipline and this pyramid um, of command. So intrinsically, you have one person at the top and then a few person in the rung below, and then a mass of soldiers who all have to do their duty um, in a similar way. And, and I think this is captured really well throughout the book. Um, not only are there very few common seamen in these portraits, um, none of them are non-white. Um, and this is probably sounds obvious, but um, the thing is that there were a lot of non-British people in the Navy at the time, including among officers. Uh, there were few examples among officers, but um, there's one at least that is quite famous, John Perkins, who made post-captain. Uh, and there are some um, print representations of John Perkins, but I don't know if they're based on, on actual paintings, uh, which is in itself quite interesting. Otherwise, uh, non-white people in this book <laughs> are only visible in the background. There's obviously uh, a, a very striking painting of uh, the death of Cook in Hawaii. And then the only other example I could find uh, was a, a lithograph of, of uh, Sir William Peel uh, lining up his guns in front of a Dukusha during, during his campaigns. And that there are three <laughs> Indian men <laughs> with their back turned <laughs> in the background. And so again, I'm not, like, Catherine just did really well to find these portraits because there aren't that many. And again, it tells a very selective story about what the British Navy was and who manned it, um, but both on the lower deck, where we know that um, maybe 15% of sailors were not British, uh, and some of these were Europeans and some of these came from, from imperial territories, but also um, among officers. Um, and the women, of course, uh, you touched upon it. Uh, again, in the book, she points out that the women are almost absent. There are a couple of portraits of wives, again, sitting in a drawing room. But this isn't because women were not at sea. We know that there were lots and lots of women who went to sea in the Navy. Um, some of them dressed up as men. Uh, some of them uh, were like kind of accompanying their husbands. Uh, aboard or like their partners otherwise and they're not listed in um, the official records of the Navy they are invisible in in the documentation and they are also invisible in the iconography um, and there's there's a lot of exciting work that's been done on women and Margaret Lincoln has a, a great book on them Elaine Murphy is working on the 17th century so hopefully we'll hear more about them but um, these scholars are having to work from snippets across the archives. And, and so these silences are there even in the visual representations of the Navy. Um, there's the old portrait of, of people like Anne Bonny, but of course she was a pirate, so she doesn't count. This is about the Navy. <laughs> um, so what else do the portraits leave out? Um, so there's a the question of fame, um, who gets to represent the Navy? But there's also a question of the world in which the Navy moves. Um, Catherine's book does really well in capturing various flavors of naval imperialism, including its desk-bound aspects. Um, so there's a portrait of, of Thomas Parry by Tilly Kettle early on in the 18th century, already showing um, the power of his bureaucracy behind the scenes. Uh, and then obviously that striking um, Arctic Council painting that we just saw. Um, this idea of abstraction and of imagining these spaces as empty, uh, as an empty sea, as, as Catherine said, is, is very interesting to me because I've been obsessed with maps for a while now and charts. Um, 
but in particular, I have recently been thinking a bit about um, the Navy and cartographical surveillance in the 19th century. And your chapter on, on, on Beaufort's portrait really gets to the kernel of his transformation. Uh, I quote from your book, uh, portraits like these, like, like the Arctic Council one, um, suggest that the mysteries of the Arctic could be mastered through the technical expertise, masculine rationality, and bureaucratic order of the British naval elite. So in your talk, you mentioned how this, in a way, is a bit of a myopic preoccupation with documentation. I wonder, though, whether, in some ways, it's a very selective and it's a very biased view, but I'm not sure about the myopic because, in a way, this focus on cartography and paperwork was very long-sighted in the sense of surveillance. Um, a map, a chart, allows you to survey and surveil what is happening on the other side of the world in a way that the immediate visual representation doesn't. So this extra layer of communication, of course, it's a simplification, but it's still one of the state's tactics for making people legible, and in this case, is making them legible at a distance. So the representation is not thorough. Again, it's very selective, and it erases all sorts of things, but it's also really powerful, um, and it's quite interesting how we might be tempted to think that it's just... Um, harmless because it's confined onto itself, but it's not, that's not necessarily the case. It's an extremely um, strong feature of uh, naval culture in this period. So I think that something striking across all the portraits, and, and not just these 19th century bureaucratic um, images, is the genericness of the landscape, of the setting. Um, so yes, the sea disappears altogether when we have these men in a dark study focusing on their maps, but the sea that was there before was already more of a stand-in, very generic, and I can, a lot of those backgrounds, uh, as Catherine really um, elucidates very well in the book, are tropes, and they could literally be cut out of one portrait and put in the background of another. So that is not attention being paid to the context of maritime operations. That is just a generic sketch of the place where these things are taking place. Naturally, these are portraits, so the focus is, of course, on the individual. But more deeply than that, the focus is on the Navy uh, and on the image of the Navy. And, and everything else is scenery, everything else is background, everything else is potentially empty, uh, and somewhere where these officers can really inscribe British might. So again, I think uh, this really shows quite well how fame and celebrity are only belonging to just a few individuals. And uh, this range of paintings uh, shows very vividly how the very structure of naval life implied this backstaging, both of other people and of the environment. Um, and so I would wonder here whether naval gazing was in many ways there from the start. It's obviously a feature of the 20th century developments, as you say in the book, but like all of this world is completely self-referential in, in that sense. Um, yes, so that's um, all I have to say. I have a lot of questions and other things we can discuss, but um, I absolutely loved the book, so I'm um, really well done. That was fantastic. for that incredibly flattering response um, it was really lovely and I think yeah kind of has given me kind of food for thought I think particularly that kind of um, the sort of question of sort of the myopic focus I mean sort of I took that I meant that quite literally in a way because I think what's kind of interesting is I pointed out telescopes you know this kind of motif that you get in naval portraiture for a long time and even kind of like it's there in the Franklin daguerreotypes and yet in that portrait of Francis Beaufort um, the one that went into the naval gallery he has a magnifying glass hanging around his neck and a pair of glasses in his hand. As the emphasis suddenly really on these kind of optical aids designed for close looking and close scrutiny rather than this kind of distanced, you know, sort of view of the telescope. So I think I was kind of using myopic in quite a sort of literal sense there of sort of looking at things close. But as you're right, that whole idea of kind of, you know, from that tiny bit of a thing that you're magnifying, actually what that is encompassing and that sort of that, in a way that is a very far-sighted kind of view, I think that's a really kind of interesting way of, 
of thinking about that sort of a bit less literally than I was, perhaps. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, um, it's true that there's this focus on, on the indoors that is quite mm -hmm. striking, mm -hmm. uh, like the notion that um, you can leave your mark even without leaving your desk, that mm -hmm. that's what matters, that's where things actually happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's a very interesting shift that I think you've identified mm -hmm. there. Does, does anyone have any questions for Catherine? <laughs> um, lots of them. <laughs> Oh, there's a microphone running around. and uh, I think there was one question there, and one question there, and one question there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> I, I, I have two questions, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. One of them is about Sir Joshua Reynolds, because he's such a magnificent figure mm -hmm. that he's not only using trends, but he's setting the trends. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, something about the portraits that he's doing with navel gaze, mm -hmm. I, I, I was wondering if there's anything about the uh, Italophilia that is very prevalent at the time, bearing in mind that the Letante Society is being formed at the time. So Joshua Reynolds actually mm -hmm. painted them with uh, Lord Elgin and all mm -hmm. of that sitting in them. And uh, the influence that the... Uh, the significance of the sea in journey in this dilettantes mm -hmm. and their efforts to conquer the world, to uh, get into the heart of the Homeric world and all of that, mm -hmm. onto the paintings that happens in Britain. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see if there are any Italian influences there. Because, for example, when you showed the Triumph of Britannia, mm -hmm. which is painted in 1764, right? Two. Two, the I print believe. is 65 and the painting is 62. I believe that's at the same time that Trevi Fountain in, in Italy is mm -hmm. uh, completed by oh. Salvi, which mm -hmm. is showing the same motives of horses rising and the Neptune figure at the top of that. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there's any influence there. And my second point is about, uh, I was wondering if there's anything about the rise of the clubs, the gentlemen mm -hmm. clubs in mm -hmm. the 18th century and early, uh, sorry, late 18th century what I'm talking about. <laughs> I think I'm talking about 19th century and early 20th mm -hmm. century because in the mm -hmm. 18th century we see the cafes and in the uh, mm -hmm. 19th century we see a lot of exactly what you see under a mm -hmm. wall which is a, a typical gentleman club which is very specialising into different things. Mm -hmm. So those are my two questions. Thank, thank you, you very much again for oh, your... Thank you. Two, two very meaty questions. Um, I'll take them in order. So the first one about the sort of Italianate kind of influences... I think it is really interesting, particularly because if you picked up the figure of Reynolds, because, you know, so he does go on a, a grand tour, and, you know, this kind of does sort of really inform his portrait, but it's a grand tour that's facilitated through the Navy. So there is this kind of intertwining for him, I think, the sort of the maritime context and this sort of, you know, kind of um, his experience of these classical influences. And that is really summed up in that, you know, in some ways sort of seminal portrait of his career of Augustus Keppel, where as a painting it is very Italianate. You can see the kind of influences of Tintoretto that he's been seeing. You can see the sort of the sort of Venetian kind of portraiture. Um, Keppel's pose is um, well, it's, sort of, it's it's long been kind of linked with classical sculpture. I think for a long time it said it's kind of Apollo Belvedere, um, but it has you know kind of since been um, I think identified as a very specific. Um, statue of Apollo um, by Pierre Legros, the sort of French 17th century, but, you know, is kind of, again, sort of fully kind of classical, that sort of, you know, contraposto, striding, pointing um, pose. And so, yeah, kind of it is this sort of, yeah, this sort of, um, you know, European aesthetic representing this kind of British subject and it is kind of, yeah, very much kind of part of that. And I think, obviously, kind of Sarah's work so much kind of looks at the transnationality within the kind of fleet of the Royal Navy, but actually what's kind of interesting is British art throughout much of the 18th century has a kind of transnationality about it as well, and that there are a lot of, well, you know, kind of we talked about the sort of um, Dutch and Northern European kind of influences in the 17th century. By the 18th century, it's a lot more kind of French art, Italian art is kind of influencing what's been done in Britain. And so it's kind of really interesting, the sort of mirroring of the sort of Navy's composition in the way that the kind of art is being um, made as well. Um, and then to answer your second question about clubs, um, I think, yeah, there sort of is a kind of a sense with 19th century naval portraiture of, you know, these portraits being displayed in sort of masculine spaces and in kind of club spaces. Um, so something like the kind of um, 
or what I think is quite interesting, the Naval Gallery that I showed a moment ago at Greenwich, um, uh, on the one hand, it is a kind of public art gallery. It's actually the first gallery in this country to describe itself as a national gallery. It beats the the, 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 the National Gallery by about two weeks. So <laughs> um, it, is, it was 200 years old this year as well. Um, um, but um, you also get officers, by the end of the 19th century, you get officers donating portraits to that in memory of other officers. And it's almost clear that they're kind of treating the space as a sort of club space where they're sort of, you know, representing themselves and, and that kind of thing, which is quite interesting. Um, and yeah, there is this, yeah, kind of... Um, yeah, sort of dialogue, these sort of masculine spaces where these sort of portraits are displayed and reflected back at the people who are in those spaces. And I think, yeah, it's quite an interesting kind of context to, to explore. I, I did actually, if I can jump in, yeah. I did actually have a question about um, what happens in other navies, mm -hmm. because obviously a lot of these artists either come from abroad or they spend long periods of time mm -hmm. training abroad. And how do officers in other navies get portrayed? Is it similar? Or? Um, I think it's sort of... It varies a little bit, but I think, you know, as, we, as we've seen, the kind of the Dutch influence is really strong and it kind of is in some ways the sort of origin of the sort of many of the tropes that we recognise in British naval portraiture actually originate in a sort of Dutch context. Um, there is kind of the... The French is sort of slightly different, although it's quite interesting. There's this one example that's in the book of portraits that are painted of British officers blockading a French port in the early 1740s and they clearly they are very bored when they're on blockade because they get a local artist from the south of France to come out to the ships and paint their portraits while they're out there. And they wear this is a time this is just before the Royal Navy introduces uniform. So they don't have uniform, but the clothing that they choose to be painted in or that the artist suggests they're painted in is a blue coat and a red waistcoat, which is exactly what French naval officers wore at that time. So it's yeah, it's kind of this sort of, you know, they're kind of they're very clearly sort of wanting this French artist to produce French style kind of naval portraits that they will kind of cover and that sort of, I think, yeah, kind of goes on to inform what the tastes were back in England. And there's this, yeah, kind of very interesting dialogue in that sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, there were a couple of other questions. I think the lady there was first. And then... <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I have two questions. One, one is a sort of a quick question, actually, in response to what you were saying about the kind of shift towards the myopic at the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. I wondered whether you thought this, this was sort of in some way related to the kind of decline of naval warfare mm -hmm. and a kind of post-Nelson moment. You know, you can't really... There's no battle mm -hmm. to represent in the background, really, at that mm -hmm. point. Um, so that's sort of one, one sort of comment question. Um, and then I also wanted to go back to Heyman's Triumph of Britannia, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> and I was... In the context of the other group portraits you've been showing... I find it really fascinating that you're seeing these naval officers as individuals, because presumably mm -hmm. the same technique of relying on existing portraits was being used to present all of those um, mm -hmm. land-based army mm -hmm. people as well yeah. in their togas or whatever. <laughs> um, and so, so the choice to represent them all separately, and, uh, and I really liked the, the point that you made about the kind of materiality of that, this kind of mm -hmm. like mm, questionably sexy relationship that these nymphs are having <laughs> with reproduced portraits do you think is there something special about the kind of fangirl culture around the navy in this moment that <laughs> differs from the fangirl culture around the army thank you two excellent questions um so yeah on the kind of the the first point about the sort of um uh, the kind of, yeah, the sort of the absence of, yeah, sort of naval battles in the sort of 19th century, I think it is, yeah, kind of part of a reconceiving of sort of naval identity and sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of that, yeah, isn't so kind of anchored in those kind of moments of conflict or those kind of very specific, obvious achievements you can point to. And there's this sort of really kind of parallel development, which is the sort of the, the nostalgia that exists for those and the way that Nelson is being literally kind of put on top of a column, you know, while kind of all this is happening. It's kind of how you, as a naval officer, position yourself in relation to that when your career looks very, very different because you've had a whole different range of opportunities. It does actually kind of interesting things to the sort of social makeup of um, the officer corps as well, that it's kind of like in the 18th century, there is quite a lot of social mobility in the Navy, which is quite unusual, um, that you get a lot of sort of the majority of officers come from middle class or sort of like professional kind of families um, and then can kind of rise up. Whereas in the army, it's still very much kind of the sort of landed elite exclusively in the officer corps. Um, and the Navy kind of facilitates this, but that's in part because you've got lots of opportunities because there's lots of battles and there's lots of that. And yet it kind of 
ossifies and becomes as much more kind of elitist in the 19th century because there aren't those opportunities. And so there's, yeah, kind of a lot of kind of interesting things that are going on that sort of um, uh, prompt that sort of refocusing um, uh, on the sort of the, the documentary and the sort of the kind of this internalization um, away from kind of the, the beach and the battle and the sort of evocations of all that drama into I'm here at my desk and this is, you know, kind of what I'm looking at. Um, and then the wonderful triumph of Britannia and fan, fan girls and fan boys. Um, <laughs> um, I think, well, I think sort of, I mean, something to go for a slightly later period, but something that kind of Jane Austen kind of captures as well. I mean, someone who, you know, she has two brothers in the Navy. I think she understands quite a lot about kind of naval culture, but the way that she kind of writes in persuasion, the sort of, you know, the kind of swooning over these kind of naval officers, I think does capture that. You've got a sense of that as well in the sort of um, response to the sort of James Clark Ross um, portrait as well. Um, it's interesting. I can't. Um, I have shamefully forgotten the name of the scholar who, who has written about scarlet fever in the Napoleonic Wars, which is the sort of um, the ways that women's attraction to army officers, so redcoats, hence scarlet fever, was sort of legitimised as a sort of, or you know, kind of almost encouraged, but also slightly kind of, you know, mocked as a slight, or you know, kind of used for sort of humour and titillation as well, but also encouraged in a way as a legitimate expression of feminine patriotism. And, you know, kind of what does a patriotic woman look like? Well, maybe she is kind of swooning over the red coats. But I think there is a similar thing that happens with, with naval officers. And perhaps, yeah, kind of, you can see it even earlier in the 18th century with, you know, kind of suggested with things like that, um, uh, like Triumph of Britannia. I mean, a lot of, you know, sort of, I talked about you know, kind of the Royal Navy being covered like a football team. Some of that as well is, you know, a good bit of reporting over, you know, who's having an affair with who, or kind of like, you know, sort of like, oh, well, his wife is cheating on him while he's away at sea, so what's he going to do? All that kind of speculation is in the sort of gossip sheets and in satirical prints and in, you know, kind of, so it is, yeah, very much kind of part of the way that, you know, the sort of celebrity that sort of Sarah has talked about, that kind of culture is, is very much part of it. This kind of romantic speculation is very much part of it. Well, it's also that in, in the 1790s, at least, it's a lot better to be in the Navy because the Navy is winning the big victories, whereas the Army is not doing particularly well. And so all of these big events that acquire prominence on the national stage, all, all the battles, like St. Capes and Vincent, Camperdown, the Nile, Trif Copenhagen, Trafalgar, all of these battles are naval battles. <laughs> and so naval officers are are the heroes that are rescuing the, the maritime nation. And they're also presumably presumably, more than the army, the ones who have the opportunity to become richer and to rise in the ranks faster because they're, you know, in I don't know, master and commander, you know, kind of mm -hmm. looting or a kind of sanitised version of looting is part of being a, a naval mm -hmm. officer as well, right? So there's, yeah. it's about wealth and mobility in that sense as yeah. well as being just like you know, winning, winning battles. Absolutely, but I think that kind of, you also get the kind of snobbery as part of that as well, which is um, something else that um, I think Austin kind of satirises quite well in Persuasion. It's, you know, the sort of um, Sir Walter Elliot being scandalised by the idea that in the Navy you can meet a man whose father your father would never have kind of deigned to speak to. Um, it's, yeah, sort of something. And so, yeah, it's that kind of, that idea that, you know, kind of they can make money out of nothing is, you know, kind of, it does mean that some they also have kind of a bit of a chip on their shoulder or that some portraits are kind of doing a bit of working a bit harder to kind of, you know, justify a particular kind of level of social status for these figures because they are seen as sort of new money and a bit kind of problematic in that sense. But at the same time, you know, you can get a man who gets very wealthy. You can kind of play the game and you can win. So there's sort of, um, yeah, that is an element of it. They're also rougher, I suppose. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part yeah. of it, because they, even when they come from a rich family, in order to succeed in the Navy, mm -hmm. they have to be in it ever since, the, like, 12, 13. Mm -hmm. They say by, the, by 20, it's too late. Mm -hmm. And so you have these boys who come straight from, like, living in mansions uh, <laughs> at two, living aboard a cramped ship and mm -hmm. having to learn the ropes. And so they have this mm -hmm. kind of quality to them mm -hmm. that, that the press makes a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Um, well, first, first of all, thanks very much. Great talk. <laughs> Enjoyed it a lot. Um, cannot wait to read the book. Um, you've focused a lot on the public aspects of mm -hmm. naval portraiture here, and, I, and Sarah, you kind of hinged on this for a moment, but I want to bring it back to the private and the intimate. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, kind of effective notions of portraiture, just for a moment, mm -hmm. um, with particular reference to the Cook portrait, mm -hmm. uh, which again you used as a hinge. Um, yeah. That portrait, I believe I'm right in saying, was commissioned and paid for by Joseph Banks. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it hung in his house yes. until 1828, I think. So yes. It was removed yeah. to Greenwich. Yes. Um, and Banks also commissioned a portrait of Charles Clerk, mm -hmm. uh, also from dance. Mm -hmm. And that portrait hangs in Government House in Wellington. Mm -hmm. It also, incidentally, has a Maori figure in it. Um, mm -hmm. So there might be something of relevance there, at least to the point that was raised. Um, but the portrait itself is also, I've, and this is conjecture really, but it's, mm -hmm. it almost looks like a pendant to Reynolds' portrait of Banks. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you hold the two up next to each other, they they sit very comfortably in each mm -hmm. other's company. Um, and uh, I, I, again, this is conjecture, but I believe that the Reynolds portrait would have been in Banks's house at the same time, at least for a certain period. Mm -hmm. So there's something to be said there about the relationship, which I would very comfortably uh, characterise as a friendship, although there was a patron relationship here too, mm -hmm. between Banks and Cook. There's something to be said about the friendship between these two men, and, and I, I kind of want to maybe problematize the characterization of the dance portrait of Cook mm -hmm. as a naval portrait per se, and maybe more as a friendship portrait. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what you think about that though. Um, I agree entirely, and as you will see when you read the book, um, the, the, the um, Reynolds portrait of Banks is right next to the portrait of Cook, and it's part of how I talk about that, and yeah, sort of actually that, that kind of dialogue is really important, and I think like it is the sort of the kind of, I think it, you can be a naval portrait and a, you know, sort of friendship portrait. I mean, another, there's sort of so many examples of this of kind of a portrait on one level having a kind of role within a particular network and a kind of private network and having a kind of public function as well. So the Charles Saunders that I showed you, the painting is made for George Anson, who's another naval officer who Saunders had sailed with. Um, they both also, um, so they were on Anson's circumnavigation in the 1740s. Keppel was on that as well. Keppel knows Reynolds. He clearly introduces Reynolds to his mates. They all commission portraits and are clearly like swapping their portraits between them. So I think Saunders owns a portrait of Anson by Reynolds. Anson owns the portrait of Saunders. And he owns a portrait of Keppel by Reynolds. So they're all kind of owning each other's portraits. And, you know, sort of clearly these images function as a way of reinforcing this kind of, these personal relationships that they have. And yet at the same time, through... The reproduction in mezzotint, you know, Saunders' portrait takes on this whole kind of public life and can be, yeah, sort of, you know, balancing on the hip of a naked scene of in Vauxhall Gardens in front of a crowd of, you know, all the sort of revelers who were there for the evening, um, you know, every night, night after night. So it's kind of, um, yeah, it's really interesting how these portraits can kind of speak to those audiences and something I'm kind of interested in is how they speak differently in those different contexts. Um, so like the sort of the, the Cook portrait, again, has this sort of role hanging within Banks's house and, you know, kind of as part of their friendship. But again, it is also one that is engraved. Um, and there's a really interesting um, quote that I like. I um, can't remember the name of the officer, but it's like a sort of junior kind of naval officer who had sailed with Cook earlier in his career. And he's writing to his brother to describe his um, cabin in his new ship. And he says, you know, it's really tiny. I've just got my, you know, kind of bed over here, my little desk. And then on the wall, I've got a print of Cook um, he has a phrase like the knight of the stern countenance or something he calls him, but it's clearly, from the way he describes it, it's clearly a print of the, of the dance portrait. And so it's quite interesting that, again, that's another kind of quite private meaning for him as a kind of a sort of mental figure that he's representing within his cabin. Um, uh, yeah, so sort of those kind of layers of, yeah, kind of public and private are quite interesting. Thank you. <laughs> So we have a lot of questions online, <laughs> but uh, we'll try to share them with you later if we can't get to all of them. But I'd like to at least, you know, honor a couple. Um, uh, so we have a, a question from Luba Kojak, and I apologize if I've mispronounced that name, um, who says, thank you, Catherine, for a wonderful talk. Could you please speak a bit more on the inclusion of animals in naval portraiture? I was fascinated by the bird of paradise in Reynolds' portrait of Captain the Honorable George Edgecombe. You mentioned that the fur costume in Wildman's portrait of Commander James Clark Ross sexualizes the work. Does the bird in Reynolds' portrait achieve a similar effect given the bird's long tail feathers, 
are characteristic of mating habits for males of that species, and the name widow could allude to the captain's sexual availability. In this sense, can the bird be understood as more than a colonial trophy or symbol, but an extension of the sitter's identity, especially through its potential status as a pet that adds another dynamic to the meaning of the animal? That's that's very interesting. Um, I mean, I yeah, kind of like... I, yes, I do know that, yes, the, the bird is a male in his breeding plumage, very importantly. That long tail is very characteristic of the of the breeding plumage of the widows, I think. I don't know how much that would have been understood by kind of Reynolds or by viewers at the time. So kind of like, um, you know, did they know this is, this is particularly the breeding plumage of this bird? I think particularly as widows are brood parasites, they're like cuckoos, they lay their eggs in the, egg, in the nests of other birds, um, which means they're very difficult to breed in captivity, which is also how we know the one in the portrait is almost certainly from Africa because it was just very difficult to get them to breed in captivity because you had to have the other species that they sort of use the nests of and it was just a very complicated thing. Um, but I think, I think yeah, I hadn't thought of it specifically in kind of a sort of romantic context, but I think, I think it is, there is a sort of flamboyance to the bird that I think is important, the way that it's tail feather. I literally kind of, you know, there's this kind of wonderfully orderly portrait where you've got these kind of columns and it's all, you know, kind of very, you know, sort of like, estate over here, sea over here, you know, kind of uh, these verticals dividing up very clearly, and then this sort of tail just kind of cuts across them all, kind of almost touches his shoulder, but not quite, and it's sort of, it kind of, it's visually disruptive within the image, and I think that kind of can, does have perhaps a sort of metaphorical significance for the sort of naval officer as this sort of mobile dynamic, slightly kind of, you know, sort of outsider figure who is, you know, kind of slightly breaking the little, the kind of, the rules and things. So, yeah, I will, yeah, I will look into... I mean, he said Edgecombe wasn't married at that time, so maybe maybe it is making a statement, I don't know. Maybe it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's an advertisement. Um, if, if people don't mind, I'm going to try to pop in at least one or two more, and then uh, we can, of course, continue this conversation um, in person. Um, Denise Ferguson asks, does the army have a similar extensive history of portraiture of leaders as the Navy? Does army portraiture become less important as the cult of the British Navy takes supremacy? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the army has an equally, um, yeah, kind of long history of portraiture. Um, I think um, Vicky Coltman um, uh, is doing some great work on army portraiture. If you're, so you're interested in that subject, look out for what, what she's doing. Um, but um, I think... There are moments when it's very close and there are a lot of kind of shared tropes um, and, um, you know, it's kind of like, in, you know, in some ways you could sort of do a sort of like, you know, kind of find and replace, you know, naval portrait, you know, well, a sword will serve brilliantly for both. So you can just keep that and then, you know, okay, we'll get rid of the sea battle in the background and we'll put in like a sort of, you know, a battlefield, some tents, you know, a sort of something kind of military and essentially the same image will kind of suffice. So there's a kind of lot of sort of overlap in that sense. Um, there's also a sense, particularly in the kind of early periods, of the kind of naval officers being slightly jealous of the sort of higher status of military officers, which is why, you know, sort of, I talked about the flagman kind of wearing fashions that ape military fashions. Um, the army has uniform before the navy, and naval officers write explicitly saying, we want uniform because the army has uniform and we feel kind of, you know, sort of like we're not getting as much respect because we don't. Um, so there is a kind of, yeah, sort of a kind of rivalry in a sense that they are kind of referring to each other's um, costumes and imagery in that, or, you know, kind of in their portraits. Um, but at the same time, I think it is interesting that they do function slightly differently culturally. I mean, the sort of the triumph of Britannia and how that is slightly different to the way that army officers were presented in their kind of classical costumes speaks to a kind of slightly different sensibility around naval portraiture, I think. And as I said, you know, kind of in the 20th century, you see it with the difference in the naval officers of the First World War versus the generals of the First World War. So there's kind of these moments where it kind of pulls apart, but also a lot of connection there as well. And then I'll just pop in one, um, one more question from Anne Stewart, who says, I would love to see 20th century examples, i.e. what marine iconography carries forward, submarines, aircraft carriers, modern equivalent of telescopes. Thank you. Um, there's, there's, not, there's not that much. As I say, it, it becomes quite internal. Um, there are, yeah, sort of not too many that actually show too much of the technology of um, uh, of the sort of, yeah, kind of naval warfare in the... I mean, you get a few, like, sort of there's... Um, we have pastel portraits by a guy called William Dring in the collection at the National Maritime Museum where, you know, you have kind of stokers in the engine rooms of, you know, kind of, and sort of all these pipes and tubes and things behind them, which is quite, quite interesting to kind of the sort of exposing the sort of guts of the ship, um, 
Um, but yeah, as a sort of general rule, there's a sort of decorousness to naval portraiture where actually sort of to be in a drawing room or just in a sort of quite abstract, you know, kind of non-specific location um, is kind of preferred over being located quite specifically on the, the deck of a modern warship. So um, we've also had, well, I'm not going to do any more questions because I know that we, for those of you who are in the room, there is a drinks reception, but um, there have been comments that people cannot wait for their book to arrive that they've ordered. And um, I would say, you know, you would probably recommend people go to the museum, maybe? Yes, that would, that would be lovely. You can go to the, <laughs> the um, Royal Museum's Greenwich Shop. You can order direct from, I mean, all good bookshops, but particularly the best bookshop is the Royal Museum's <laughs> Greenwich Bookshop in this And instance. I'm guessing there are some paintings on walls that people could maybe yes. see yes this is this is great you're doing better plugging than i am um uh yeah so um you can come to the national Maritime museum and the queen's house in greenwich um where a large number of the portraits that you see in the book and that you've seen as well in tonight's talk on display so you can see them for yourselves so for those of you in the room and those of you online if anyone is in the london area greenwich mm -hmm. area great place to go yep Wonderful. Um, so before we head out, um, I just want to give one final thank you to both of our speakers, Catherine and Sarah. Mm -hmm.